All right, so at RIT in 2009, I ran an open seminar for the honors program in developing educational games for the one laptop per child, which is where I got into open source. I had heard about open source. I am, I am a media and film professor gone horribly wrong and now a full professor in a computing department. So I had heard about open source all these years and also said kernel programming, God help me, I can't do kernel programming. So I never got into it, but then I got into this and it said, oh, collaboration, that's good stuff. So we were able to accelerate that honors seminar totally through student interest, right? It was not my agenda to do this. This is what the students wanted. So we now have a FOSS across the curriculum program. We have a full academic minor that we started about 2014 was when that got approved. Um, we have a non-academic set of engagements around hackathons and student community and student presentations called uh, Fawcett RIT. And RIT is a cooperative education program. That means that our students have to get full-time full full paid internships to graduate. And so we set them up when we can with open source internships for humanitarian projects. We've been doing that for uh, since 2011. Um, we did that in part through the support from Red Hat. Thank you, Red Hat. I'm still eking out the last couple of dollars from their generosity. Uh, LibreCore is something that we formalized in 2017 through 2019 to start around those internships. We wanted to kind of brand it and start working even more with NGOs than we had in the past. We started working with UNICEF to provide half-day trainings on how the open source way works for the, um, the venture teams that they fund. Uh, UNICEF Innovation has a program in which people apply for grants to develop humanitarian software, hardware, all different kinds of applications, they have a drone program. So we started mentoring those teams first in a half day on what open source way looked like, and then working with them, they contracted with us to work with a set of their teams for a year to do this mentorship. And they've just announced their formalized mentorship program that they built off of the work that we did and they're doing that with one of the students they hired full time for me when he graduated. So it's, a, it's always good to have stuff like that happen. Uh, through the auspices of the Ford Foundation, I got to be part of their, and the Sloan Foundation, but it's, the, it's on the Ford's webpage, Josh, what can I say? Um, the first digital infrastructure, critical digital, digital infrastructure research cohort, where we studied Pi PI. And what our case study was about was really finding out where the breakdown is in communication and in services and support between the developers and the users, which came down to a lot being the developers who were leading and the people who were assigned to do work that wasn't generating code. And the fact that anything that wasn't generating code eventually got seen as slowing down the project even the documentation, onboarding, all that stuff you need, right? But no. So they had this conflict and it, it caused a problem. That also led to us kind of shaping how we handle what we do for open source mentorship now within LibreCore. Um, in 2019, Josh came, uh, Jacob came up to my table where RIT had a table with our students and says, hey, Hopkins is starting an OSPO. And I'm like, awesome. Now I can club my university into starting an OSPO. And so I went back to them and I wrote them a white paper. They said, and we've been talking often, off and on here, is, is an OSPO top down or bottom up? So I went to the top because administration, right? They got to open an office. I don't get to do that by myself. And they said, call a college wide meeting. I said, I can't call a college-wide meeting. You have to call a college-wide meeting. And, and they did. And the thing that opened my eyes was not that there would be faculty input, but 50 faculty and staff from 37 different units across RIT. So we're not just talking faculty. We're not just talking academic. We're talking the library. We're talking IT services. We're talking research centers. Said, we want to be part of this somehow. That funny thing that happened in March 
that Saeed talked about, right? So we, we spent time meeting online. The faculty had been interested. They formed a, a wish list document of things they would want that type of thing to do. The provost said, go ahead and write me a charter. I wrote a charter. We went out to the Sloan Foundation and talked to them about perhaps supporting what they did, and they generously funded um, partially the OSPO, but specifically a Libre Corps team that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, so we had a very quick turnaround, right? From me submitting a white paper to my administration, nine months later, they bless it. Several months later, we're in business. So now what have we done? Part of what Sloan was interested in supporting was breaking the model of faculty get support from one student for one semester. They get money to hire a student for a specific amount of time to help with their research project. It's a very common model. And we wanted to be able to bring a team approach as we had to humanitarian groups. And we also wanted to be able to do shorter engagements and longer engagements. We put out a call for participation. We got 26 applications. So we were overwhelmed from the beginning, but we demonstrated the desire that faculty needs support, right? The issue is, is that faculty and researchers are faculty and researchers. They're not open source community managers. They're not UI, UX people. They're not documentation people. And yet, if their research, open source software, open hardware, open data, open any of those things, right? If they don't build a community, if they don't get it out there, it may as well just be like in the corner of their office somewhere. So they need help doing this stuff in addition to development. So what have we done? We built our website. We have a playbook on our website that talks about how we engage with our faculty, staff, and students. Um, we put out best practices. As Saeed said, working with administration is difficult. Policy is a nightmare. Corporate OSCOs, corporate OSCOs can say, hey, here's our open source policy. You do that. You're an employee. We have three categories of people in the university, especially at RIT. We have employees who are staff. We have faculty. We have students. Um, at my university, students are their own class because they own their own IP. That's not common in most universities. Even if it's your homework, the university owns it. The only thing the university owns that my students produce is if the university pays them to work on something. So they're a whole separate class from staff in terms of IP rights, what they can do with what they want to do with it, right? And then there are faculty. Faculty are this gray area. They're employees, but scientific method. They're supposed to put that stuff out there for other people to work on, build, expand our base. But also the university and or they would also sometimes like to make money off of their IP. And so how do we navigate staff who you can theoretically tell what, you, what they can do, students who you can't tell what to do with their IP, and faculty who speaking as one, I will say you can't tell us to do anything. We're, we're loose cannons, we will do whatever we want because we have tenure and thank you very much. So it's, it's a very interesting space to work in. And so you see the word best practices there because I hope I'll get to an open source policy for my university over two years, but you saw Saeed's list of players. Policy is hard. But for me to say, oh, we recommend that you do this. I don't have to get approval to recommend anything to anybody. Right? So we have recommendations for contributing to open projects, whether it's data, hardware, software, what have you. It might look like the draft of policy I'm putting out there somehow, but you know, it's not policy yet. It's just a recommendation. We also have best practice recommendations for faculty to promote their open work. Universities, for the most part, disincentivize open work. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But faculty have to learn how to try to pitch their work and convince their peers to accept it the same way that they'd accept an article that got published in journal Nature. Right? There's this whole thing that goes on. More on that in a moment. So we've put out our best practices. We have that guide for how to use your work in evaluation, tenure, and promotion. We've put out a Zotero library of resources. This is our first professional development effort. Here, faculty, here's more about 
what open is in your field, not just open source software. Here's how you do it. Here's how you contribute. Here's what other people are doing. Just something to get the discussion started. On the software side, Saeed mentioned the fact that he has no idea what open work is being done at the university by anybody. This is not a problem. This is an age-old problem beginning with the internet. If not before, I went to the first Mozilla Developers Conference because I'm a thousand years old. And they said that one of the things they did just before the conference is they scanned their network and they found that there were 1,100 servers running inside Mozilla under people's desks that they didn't know about. <laughs> okay, so it's not just academia, it's, it's everybody has problems like this. So one of the ways, you know, Saeed and I are both trying to incent faculty to not only do open work, but tell us and help us find it. So the, the system that Said is building incents people kind of like with mini grants, is that right, that for developers fund? What we're trying to do is work with the software group, the chaos community that does metrics and analytics. We are talking with the Center for Open Science, which is a key open science publication dissemination site. We're working with I, IEEE SA Open to build a system by which our faculty can submit their work, you know, go ahead and submit this once. You don't have to update your Vita every six months, right? Submit this once and we'll generate metrics for you to help make your case for annual evaluation, tenure, and a pro promotion. Here's the impact. Here's where the translation of my work landed. And here's why it's important. Maybe it's not a journal article in journal nature, but it's worth something and, and you should incent me to keep doing this work. Um, as I said, a lot of the funding from the Sloan Foundation goes to support a dedicated LibreCore team to support our faculty and staff projects. Out of those 26 people who submitted, a couple really wanted us to do stuff that we couldn't do for them or they weren't ready, um, but we ended up with about 23 that we're working with. We've finished with nine already. We're currently working with six, eight are in the pipeline now, and we'll be working to open a second RFP within the next 30 days. These faculty work in fields as wide as computational astrophysics, international deaf literacy education, cybersecurity, vineyard genetics, accessibility of open source journals to screen readers. Yes, we publish a journal of teaching science for students with disabilities that is inaccessible by screen readers so its blind authors cannot read their published work on the web. Because, because accessibility, web accessibility, and, and to publish things that look like the printed paper document or the, the Acrobat file or the Word file, it's a nightmare. Who knew, right? I looked at this and said, oh, you know, we'll, we'll fix this in a couple of weeks. Yeah, what is it, six months, eight months, we're still working on it? Um, we're working with some professors interested in indigenous science and getting more of the word out. It's, it's a big spread of stuff. We work with a lot of people. We believe in release early, release often. Right? It's, a, it's a, an open source maxim that works some of the time. You have some projects that don't want to send something out to the world until it's finished. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have people who say, here's my pseudocode, let's build it. Right? So we're much more like, here's our pseudocode, let's build it. University OSPO is going to look different. Saeed's is going to look very different than mine. Hopkins is a much bigger institution. RIT is not small. We've got 20,000 students. We have, we've gone from being a teaching university to an R2 university in about 10 years. It's a pretty good achievement. But we don't hold a candle to the complexity that Saeed has to deal with. Um, but we work with OSPO++, we work with CHAOS, we work with IEEE SA Open, we work with the Open 3D Foundation, we work with the Center for Open Science, 11 conference and colloquia, five articles and three podcasts in under 12 months because we want to get the world out. We want to get this stuff out to you to work on. Everything on my website, everything that I've listed here, everything that's a link, you can download it. You want to see what our charter was, you want to see what our white paper was, so you can try to sell an OSPO to U University, take it. 
call us up, ask us why we picked this, why we did that, set a Zoom meeting up with us. And we do it because of email like this that I got just before this conference opened, right? Here's a professor in India who, hey, you know, this is cool. I want to do this at my university. How do we get it done? So we're probably going to have a lot of egg on our faces before we're done because we're putting stuff out as soon as we think of it. But that's the point. We want input. We want people to do better. We want those kind of communications that Saeed talked about, those conversations one-on-one. -on -one. So what did we learn? First and most important, never name anything open A. Every piece of software you use to munge words will try to make it a mail to link. I spend more time delinking the name of my organization than I care to tell you. Um, as Saeed also implied, policy at a university is a nightmare. Um, most faculty and students and staff want to do open work, and some of them really do not because they're afraid of giving stuff up. You in the corporate world already know this already. They're worried they're going to harm their careers because I get judged for my tenure and my promotion by a jury of my peers, and they know how to think about this stuff one way. It doesn't matter that science is supposed to be open, research is supposed to be open, data is supposed to be open. There are, you have to do it the way I did it when I was coming up, and these are the metrics. It's journal publications and everything else is second, right? Or it's a $10 million NSF grant instead of a three quarter of a million dollar NSF. Good on you, Saeed. Um, so the link here is an article um, about Sci-Hub. Right, that talks about everything from Aaron Schwartz's problems and how that ended up to the fact that important to us in LibreCore because I hire one software engineer. I hire a program manager student, I hire a documentation student, and I hire two UI UX students because this is about access. It's not just about code. And so getting people access to all kinds of different things are important. And one of the things this article says is even the people who have legal, legitimate access to the information that's published in Sci-Hub, that Sci-Hub is in trouble for because they're breaking copyrights, people would rather go to Sci-Hub because they can find stuff easier. The UI UX is better on that than it is at their own institution. So this stuff is key. So what's next? Um, Maybe we'll have policy by December of next year. Maybe we won't. No promises. Um, we're going to continue our fellows program through the next year. We're going to continue to look for additional partnerships at universities, with industry, inside RIT, outside your RIT. One of the great things that's happened with publishing early and often is I have projects now coming to me, some of them based in universities, sometimes not. And they say, can you help us? And I can say, well, you know, right now, my team works with RIT professors. But I can connect you with the RIT professors. And if one of them says, this is cool, I want to contribute, then they can submit an RFP. And then maybe I can help you, because we've onboarded an RIT professor to this external project. No grants, open source licenses, all the stuff that Saeed talked about, right? And we're supposed to run a conference by the end of next year to talk about what we did, to get our faculty to talk about what they did. I'm not sure yet. The original vision was an internal conference, but maybe we'll expand it. I don't know. We'll see what the interest is. Come see us on the show floor. Mike, Urvashi, Django, Rahul, and who did I miss? Emmy. Emmy, they're going to be at the table. Talk to them about that. Emmy and I will be presenting at the Chaos Con Thursday about the software you saw a quick screenshot, that system for registering and getting metrics. And we have three minutes left. I hope there's time for a question. Thank you for your time and attention. <laughs> quick questions before you all get to go have lunch or dinner or whatever it is that you're eating? Yes, sir. So they, the, they asked us to turn everything into an Acrobat doc, so I think it's going to be distributed. But if you I already have your address, Chris, your email address, anybody wants a copy of that in either PowerPoint or Acrobat, come find me at the table or the students at the table. We'll get you one. Sir. Yeah. 
very carefully. No, old joke, sorry. Um, so yes, it's individual, right? Mike can talk more about that in great detail because Mike is my assistant director. And so he's his job to do a lot of the scoping, but a lot of it is what do you need, right? Here are the things we can deliver. What do you need? What's within our scope? Both not in terms of what's the skill set of my team, but how many other things are these folks working on at the same time? We have people whose engagements have slid more than one semester. We've had people who just said, I have all this education material for J5 or P5JS, right? The, the interactive Python or the interactive, yes. I just want to get my stuff up there. I've been working with this community for years. I have all these lesson plans help. So, you know, that takes a couple of weeks and we got her stuff up there and the community was happy and she's happy. So it all depends. We are hoping to convince them. Okay. And we are hoping that the software we are building, which is open and shared and part of chaos and so on and so forth, anybody can grab it if they want it. It's still early stage. But we're hoping to, to, to show them a giant carrot for doing the tiny little stick of entering their URLs into our form. So it, it varies university to university. Some, because some universities have, don't have an OSPO, but they have some spec or some recommended best practices. Some places will just say any OSI license. Some will say any permissive license. Some will say these licenses because they are permissive and OSI licenses. We have a list in our recommendations that's like, you know, for, for software, these are permissive enough that they allow the university and you to get IP but you, or, or to fund your work or to commercialize your work, but they're also open licenses. So it, it varies. We can show you the list. It's actually, if you look at the best practices on our website, it'll show you what we've pointed to for software, hardware, data, all that stuff. Um, I think we're officially out of time, but I'm happy to stay here and talk to whoever wants to talk.